So uh, the talk today is going to be on languages of the biblical world. In other words, I want us to get to know the different things that you see if you ever um, change the channel and you see ancient aliens on History Channel. They're talking about these languages because people don't know any better. Now you're going to know better. <laughs> All right. So languages of the biblical world. First, as we get started, uh, I want to talk about how writing happens. Now, for us, um, writing is a given. Literacy is a given. Most of us grow up learning how to read and write. Some in the room here may have known someone at some point um, who couldn't read very well or couldn't read at all. Literacy is a new thing in human history, but it's an innovation. And what is it innovating? Literacy is, or writing itself, I should say, is a way in which human beings are able to code their ideas and their thoughts, even their speech, into a new technology. I bet you've never thought about writing as a technological innovation. Usually we have some kind of electronic you know, component today when we talk about tech or technology. But in the past, imagine you lived in a world where nothing was written down and you had to remember. Now that's quite meaningful, especially when you think about certain aspects of scripture that seem to be things we don't quite relate to as much these days. Let's say a genealogy maybe, for instance. But those genealogies are ways in which people kept their memory alive through the community. Well, a point in time came where people started to represent their ideas with pictures. And then those pictures developed into meaning. Next slide, please. Today, I want to talk about just a an overview of all the different places and languages that are part of what make up the biblical world, one way or another, okay? So uh, everyone's familiar with this map, I hope, right? This is the Eastern Mediterranean. You see below in orange, Egypt. So we'll call that ancient Egyptian, right, that language. As we move up in the purple area, you see it's the Hittite Empire. Uh, the Hittite language doesn't play as much of a role in the development of scripture, but its culture has some interesting insights into rituals and how people um, would perform cultic practice and things like that, so it's worthy of study. It's also the closest language to English of all of these. Uh, I'm going to say a, a, a small sentence here, and if anyone wants to translate what I'm saying, I welcome it, okay? This is Hittite now, ready? Water Akwemi. Water Akwemi. Any guesses? Water is wet? So That's not bad. Very good. Water, aqua and me. Water, I am drinking. I'm drinking water. So you probably know agua or aqua from its Latin version. Me. Right? <laughs> it's not too different than how we say me in English. So now, the rest of Hittite's a little wild, so I'll, I'll forget those examples. But there are certain elements of it that are very close to us in English. Hittite culture is important, and it's a new field. Or it's not new, but um, people who are biblical researchers are getting more and more interested. Now, the big ones happen where you see blue and pink. And in those areas, that's Mesopotamia. And in Mesopotamia, one major language played a huge role in the development of literacy for the entire region. This language is called Akkadian. I'm going to be talking about it a lot. Um, but before I get into Akkadian, I want to go take us to ancient Egyptian. Now, in ancient Egypt, you guys are familiar with the idea of a hieroglyph, right? They look like a bunch of pictures. Guess what? They are. Okay? You were right. You were right to think so. Now, when you see the pictures, the big image on the left is the actual Egyptian language coded into hieroglyphs. When I say coded, I just mean written, written into hieroglyphs, right? But I like coded better because 
you know, it translates your thought to something um, more tangible, like writing. Okay. On the bottom right is something called the Narmer palette. Now, the Narmer palette might be our first evidence of actual Egyptian. If you look at it, it's a little more artistic. You see images, and these images don't necessarily indicate writing. It's kind of like art, right? And so that first image I, I, I had on the screen, you know, this early human lithograph or a, a pictograph written on rock was a, a pure image. This, what you see in the bottom right here, is the beginning of where images start to have secondary meanings. Think about different pictures that you could look at and create um, a sentence out of. We do it with emojis and things all the time nowadays. But <laughs> what if you start looking at an image and you can't quite see it, and I don't have a, a, a pointer with me, but on the second piece, the piece on the right, in the, not the top row, but the, the next row down, that's the most solid, there's, it looks like a little T sort of thing. And that's an icon um, that is vocal, if you vocalize those two things, they create the word Narmer. And so it's thought that this is our earliest evidence of hieroglyphic, tr or transition from art to hieroglyphs, okay? Um, does anyone here know ancient Egyptian? No believers? Okay, have you ever heard of a behemoth? Yeah. What's a behemoth? What's a behemoth? What do you use it for? A behemoth? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's like a big monster thing, could have been a Big monster thing, could have been a dinosaur, something like we're, we're talking about a beast, right? A beast. Um, well, in ancient Egyptian, Pihemot, where the Hebrews get it from, probably refers to a water beast like a hippo. Um, some have said a crocodile, right? How about Pharaoh? What's a Pharaoh? Okay, a king. So they equate it, they equate it with Horus, who is one of their deities. But king is actually the word it means. Epuru in Coptic gives us king. Now, there may be a different etymology in the um, you know, late Egyptian, but that's a, a conversation for another time. All that to say, you guys know some, you know some ancient Egyptian. So when you walk away, you should feel empowered. You can put it on your CV next time you apply for a job, right? <laughs> uh, next slide, please. Please. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Now, this is something called Sumerian, and it's in proto-cuneiform. This word cuneiform, you've heard it on ancient aliens probably, or Sumerian for that matter, is a type of writing that takes clay and draws pictures in clay, and those pictures develop meaning over time. Originally, they were used as symbols and tokens, and they were matched with goods or commodities and things. And then, little by little, they get more abstractized, and um, they develop some kind of meaning. Why do you think they're writing in clay? Say again? That's the best answer I've heard. It's what, they've ha it's what they had, right? Where are you going to go to your paper store in ancient Sumeria, in ancient southern Iraq? You're probably not going to have a whole lot of materials to develop writing surfaces, but you got a lot of clay. You have a lot of clay. And so these we have a lot of because they're more durable than things like papyrus or um, parchment, things that are made of organic material. What's the shelf life? We have old books in our house. I know I do, you know. Um, how long do they last before the pages, like, hey, gentle, gentle, sweetie, don't, don't, don't touch that, right? <laughs> you have to be careful with these organic materials that are made from trees or animals and things like that. They don't last as long as mud, especially when someone comes to your village and burns it down and fires your clay and it's preserved even longer. Now, some of this is interesting. You don't know as much Sumerian as you do Egyptian. Okay, you know more Egyptian than Sumerian. Um, 
In Texas, Texans might understand more Sumerian than other people, though, because we have these um, types of dwellings that are made of something called adobe. What's adobe? It's like, yeah, clay or mud brick type of house, right? So this, this has been traced back to the Sumerian hedubah, right, which is the house of clay. I forget what the other one is, clay writing or something, right? If you look closely, you can see things like a jar, and you can see a stalk of grain. That stalk of grain in Sumerian is spoken as she. That's how they say grain. But later on comes to just make the sound she. So eventually, Sumerian is going to continue developing. And uh, Next slide, Jonathan. It will be a system that over time is less identifiable by an image and more transmitted by convention. In other words, people draw the images so long, they start to get fast, teacher to teacher to teacher. It looks a little more abstract. And in fact, if you visit some museums and you see Neo-Assyrian cuneiform, that's about more than 2,000 years after Sumerians being written. And that's a long time, right? We're talking like this is ancient for the ancients, OK? It develops considerably. It still looks like cuneiform, and, and the untrained eye may not be able to perceive a, dis, uh, a, a difference, but it does develop. And so on the left is Sumerian, on the right is Akkadian. Uh, on the right is actually an excerpt from the, the Louvre stela of Hammurabi's code, and it's written like this. So Sumerian gets more and more abstractized, but its system is then adopted to another language that has nothing to do with it. Nothing to do with it. Um, does anyone know Japanese or Chinese in the room? A little bit? Little Chinese? So Chinese, you, you use pictographic images, right? If you want to say university, you say big school, right? Um, and so the Japanese got their writing system from the Chinese by adapting it pulling it over and modifying it a little bit. That's what happens with Sumerian to Akkadian. Now, people who know Chinese and Japanese know they're nothing alike. They're radically different. Same with Sumerian and Akkadian. Akkadian is more familiar to us, though, because it is a, next slide, please, Jonathan. It is a Semitic language. Now, we've heard this word Semitic before, I would think. And it's most important because it's a family, the same way things like Latin, and Italian, and French, and Spanish, Portuguese, Romanian. Uh, there's a couple other smaller uh, languages. We may call them dialects. But they fit in the Latin family. Some could argue English is, is Latin because it's 40% Latin. Um, it's originally Germanic, of course. But what that means is there's some kind of root that's common to all of them that makes jumping from one to the other easy, OK? And the, the Semitic languages that we know of, or that at least survive, are things like Akkadian, which survives in textual form. There's some Akkadian spoken, but it's, it's part of other dialects um, today, so it's not true Akkadian. True Akkadian's extinct, like Sumerian. Aramaic, which is the language of Jesus, Right? It's the language of um, certain books of the Old Testament. There's, of course, Hebrew. You guys have heard of Hebrew, I would think. Then there's Arabic and Ethiopic. So the classical language of Ethiopia is like African Aramaic. Then there are the Canaanite languages, things like Phoenician, Moabite, Ammonite, uh, etc. They're important for the study of the biblical world because when we can see what's being written by Israel's neighbors, we get an insight into seeing what their world was like. Next slide, please. Question. Yes. Can you say a few words about the difference between Hebrew and Aramaic? Uh, yeah, actually. Um, can we save it? I'll come back to it. OK. No, but it's a, it's a great question. And um, I'll, I'll to make uh, appropriate comparisons. Now, with Akkadian, I would say Akkadian is the most important language of the world of the Old Testament um, outside of Hebrew. 
Aramaic as well, uh, you know, but the, the difference is we have more surviving Aramaic, oh, I'm sorry, Akkadian documents than we do Aramaic ones. Again, why? Durable material. Durable material, number one. Number two, this was used as a lingua franca. It means every different political entity, whether they're smaller um, local city-states or client kingdoms of bigger states, or even the ancient Egyptians, they would use Akkadian for international correspondence. The way if you visit a foreign country, someone uh, doesn't, you know, you go to, uh, I don't know, Poland, someone doesn't say, bon, Monsieur Gustafsson. They say, hello, Mr. Gustafsson, right? Because English is the widely known language, right? Akkadian was that way across the area. And it was that way from an, from an early period, but it really becomes more and more important during the period of Neo-Assyrian expansion as Assyria expands. So if you go back to um, the like Book of Second Kings, for example, you read about the growth of Assyria. Next slide, we'll just kind of show the way the map moves and develops. And the Assyrian language is Akkadian. The Assyrian language is Akkadian. And so materials about the biblical world that are not part of the Bible tend to be written in this language. Anyone who's a serious researcher of the Old Testament typically will study Akkadian because it gives you access to these materials. And guess what? They're not all translated. And guess what? We're still finding more and more and more of them. Some of them um, in a, I'll call it righteous, or maybe some will say legal um, way where you get permission to do an appropriate dig, uh, of, like a, an archeological dig. Others, they're illicit um, and on the black market. You may have heard in the last uh, 10 years or so about things going on in Iraq and Syria where looters would pillage these mounds and um, these archaeological sites and just dig them up treasure hunting because they know Akkadian tablets uh, can make money on the black market. Okay, So things are still being found. Things are still untranslated. And through Akkadian, we get to know a lot about the world. Now, I, I keep bugging Jonathan every time he turns away is when I want him to change the, the slides. <laughs> um, this is not only the language of Assyria. It's also the language of Babylonia. Okay? They're both Semitic-speaking powers. Now, what do the Babylonians do that's famous in the Old Testament? That's it. They destroy Jerusalem and they people into bondage and bring them into Mesopotamia. They bring them um, into exile, okay? So all of these things are happening concurrently with the development of the Israel, the development and destruction of the Israelite monarchy. Next slide, please, John. So with the Akkadian documents, we have a lot of things we can do with it. Maybe I'll start with the bottom first. Um, no, I'll, I'll start with the top. I'll start. I, I just I, I go back and forth each time I do this. Okay, so in some art, kings like of the Northern Kingdom, Jehu, for example, is shown um, paying tribute to an Assyrian king named Shalmaneser. Sennacherib's prism, which is this, it's a monument, but it's a written monument. So it's like an inscription, a stone and I think it's uh, clay. Um, originally, but it's text, and it tells the story of the campaigns of King uh, Sennacherib of Assyria. Yeah, question? How big is it? Good question. Um, anyone been to the British Museum? I'm not sure. It's in, I think it's in the British Museum, but uh, I would have to look it up. Okay, that's a good question. Uh, is it little or is it a uh, larger document, or like a giant monument. Guess what? Akkadian comes in all shapes and sizes, and one of the, the tough parts about Akkadian, a lot of the tablets are this small. Now this, I just, I can't even guess the size. To me, it looks like this or bigger. I just, I don't know. I would have to look up the dimensions for it. Um, in any case, on this, 
is contained the story of Sennacherib's campaigns. And among those are his campaigns to the West. What is Sennacherib famous for in Isaiah and Kings? Right? Besieging Jerusalem. Right? And so what's fascinating is this was dug up not too long ago in human history. I mean, what, a couple hundred, a uh, couple hundred years maybe. <laughs> so, but still in, in, in biblical history, that's not long ago, right? And it tells a story that something the Bible tells, but from a different perspective. Have you ever, and I don't encourage this, okay, but have you ever watched the news, <laughs> quote unquote? <laughs> Not recently, amen, amen, me too. <laughs> you might channel and then change the channel and hear the same topic told a very different way. Very different indeed, right? Well, nowadays we have access to foreign TV and so we can hear different perspectives. What's so cool about that event is it's recorded not just in scripture, and in Akkadian, it's also recorded by Herodotus, who's a Greek historian, writing much later and provides some different details to the account. What that does, though, no matter what people say, and Sennacherib says a, a fun thing. He says, as for Hezekiah the Judean, I kept him trapped like a bird in a cage. Right? That's his spin on saying, I besieged Jerusalem but wasn't able to take it. Right? The, uh, eventually a deal's reached, the city's saved, we know the story from scripture. But his presentation of it is in succession of victory, 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 and I kept them trapped. I kept him trapped like a bird in a cage. Oh, very nice, right? Hearing that, yes. Well, I just looked up a picture of the prison, and it's next to some arrowheads, and it looks like it's about two or three feet tall. Okay. So good guess, right? A good. I was thinking water cooler size, but. You know, thank you for that. Thank you for something like this. Excellent. Um, all that to say, it's things like this or things like during the Babylonian captivity, we see provisions for Jehoiakim, who's one of the final uh, kings of Judah, brought into exile and settled into Babylon. We see this material attested in Akkadian documents, okay? Now, that's specific instances where Akkadian is useful for understanding the world of Scripture. The other interesting thing, and I almost think it's more important, this is the stuff you hear in your studies. Well, the people would do this and this on this holiday, or you know, they would have a tradition of walking from this place to this place, you have been told, you know, in your study of Luke, for example. We read things like letters, contracts, we read myths, we read ritual texts. What else do I have up there? Laws, um, chronographies, histories. All of these things help us construct a world to understand that world. Now, if you, uh, let's say you took your, I don't know, your, uh, your office, and maybe in your office you've got your scripture, and you've got your, your admin paperwork, you've got uh, billing. You have, well, they're all on the computer now. But you have all these different things in paper, and you took a city of offices and crumpled them all up, threw them up in the air, and found them a couple thousand years later, and were able to read them. That's what we do with Akkadian. And so we get more and more of the story of the life of these people who live not just in Mesopotamia, but in the Levant, in places like um, ancient Israel, Lebanon, Syria, etc. So for me, it's the stuff on the bottom that's really interesting because you get to know the lives of people, especially letters. You can see when people get kind of ornery. You can see when things annoy people, right? What they're interested in, what they plead for. These are real people writing, you know, even if they're having it commissioned by a, a professional scribe. It's their feelings that have been coded into this text and they have survived um, the millennia for us to now read. Uh, next slide, please. In addition to Akkadian, again, Semitic language in the East, we come closer to the West, and we have languages like Aramaic, Moabite, Hebrew. I mention these languages specifically because there are a number of inscriptions 
that are directly related to uh, the Hebrew Bible. In fact, there's a Moabite inscription and an Aramaic inscription. This is a picture of an Aramaic one called the Tel Dan inscription that mentioned the house of David. Um, in a number of Hebrew shards, a shard is a piece of pottery that's broken and people would write on it. Why? All they got. It's all they got. It's what they had, exactly. Good job, right? Okay, next slide, please. So the languages of scripture as they're presented to us. There are three sure languages and a couple winks of Aramaic in the Hebrew, or I'm sorry, winks of uh, Akkadian in the Hebrew Bible. You wouldn't know that because it's not presented that way. It's presented like people's names and things like that, or there's a form of a verb that, you know, oh, it's a rare form. Well, it's prominent in Akkadian, and you're reading a text that's relevant to that period or something, right? So by and large, though, Hebrew and then New Testament, Greek. But there's a part of the Old Testament that is written in Aramaic, um, and that's a major portion of the, the middle of the book of Daniel and Ezra. There's a couple phrases here and there. There's one in Jeremiah, and then there's um, the name of a site translated in Genesis that's in Aramaic. So why these languages? Well, Hebrew, and gosh, you know, that's kind of lazy, say Hebrew in the Hebrew Bible. There's probably four Hebrews, four types of Hebrew in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. What I'm saying is four dialects. Now, they're intelligible, but you can see them in periods the same way you might um, read Ben Franklin. Right? If you read Ben Franklin, he writes before the conventions of Webster, so the spellings are a little different. But it's English, you know. Some of them um, look like Mark Twain. What's Mark Twain famous for, among other things? Sorry? Surely. Uh, but writing in the vernacular, right? right? Quoting people the way they, they spoke instead of just... Um, in a high literary style. So in telling stories about the self, it'd say, you ain't, right? And the people reading this in text and things like that. So sometimes when people from the Northern Kingdom are speaking, you can read their accent. It's an interesting thing, but we just call it all Hebrew, okay? Of course, Aramaic is prominent because after Akkadian stopped being the lingua franca of the Middle East, Aramaic did. Why is that? Well, the Assyrian Empire saw that, and I'm, I'm inferring some of this, that Aramaic was much easier to teach, to write, to transport than something like Akkadian that required a substantial amount of scribal training. There's 22 letters in the Aramaic alphabet, just like Hebrew. And that's, that's not so bad, as opposed to several thousand signs and characters that have different reading values like Akkadian does. So it's more mobile, maybe it's more accessible, it's easier to create more scribes in different places. And so Aramaic is started by the Assyrians, carried over by the Babylonians, and then the Persians, when they take over, they administer the West in Aramaic. Because, hey, if it's, if it's not broke, why fix it? This, of course, leads to the time of Jesus. Our New Testament is given to us in Greek, however, well, uh, it makes sense. A lot of the different um, the letters, for example, the letters of Paul, they're going to Greek-speaking places, right? But some people think that, and there's a, there's a what is it, an Aramaic primacy theory, something like that. The New Testament was written in Aramaic. Um, I would at least, I would say it's written in Greek, by Aramaic-speaking people. And I think we talked about that a couple Bible studies ago, right? being able to see the world as the, the ancient Judeans did. Uh, next slide. So, and that's what I just said, I guess. Uh, we'll look at the picture. We'll appreciate it. It's a medieval Byzantine manuscript, so it's not the oldest of the Greek, but it has an icon, so you know it's the Gospels. Oh, next one, please, next slide. So we have... In our New Testament, a number of phrases in any Bible that you pick up, this one, and that one, and the ones on the, 
the cart over there, where you open it up and you will see phrases like tlitha qum. A fun, fun little story, my wife and I speak Aramaic. I do because I'm a nerd, she's a native speaker. And one time, my daughter was, she sat down in a hallway somewhere. I said, you know, get up off the floor, sweetie. And I was speaking to her, and I said, Tlitha Qum, and I go, oh. I just quoted the gospel. Anyway. <laughs> so it's interesting that a lot of these words survive in whatever translation of the text that you're using. Okay, and it tells us that Aramaic is operative in the culture and that what we see um, when we read the text, a number of these, you're probably all familiar with these verses, right? And These are phrases, you know, or words. Some, sometimes you can have a word and a phrase at the same time because it's a verb that does many things um, that we have with us today. So this is an overview, you know, in a short amount of time. These are the languages that are important to the study of Scripture. They're the languages that are, uh, the Scripture is written and passed down in. And in the time remaining, I'll field any questions that anyone has. Uh, what was your name again? Larry. Larry ha asked about the relationship between Hebrew and Aramaic. And I think that might be something like um, Spanish and Italian. Spanish and Italian. Um, so, buon giorno, buenos dias. Okay, you hear in the bueno and the buon the same root, right? The same way you would hear tov and tovo between Hebrew and Aramaic. They're cousins, and they're not intelligible at first listen or first. You know, I'd say first glance, but it doesn't work, right? So first time you hear them, what are they saying? But with patience and a little conditioning, you start to understand how their words shift. Oh, okay, Melech, king, is Malko, king, right? Um, we have Elohim, Eloho. So it's basically the same roots that are vocalized in different ways. And if you think of it geographically, think of where on the map, uh, ancient Israel is, and if you go just over to the right and up, just go inland. It's how the people of inland speak, right? In California, it's easy because you can say, you know, they're the coastal people, and then, you know, off in the inland empire, they have their own dialect that goes up to Vegas, and they speak it in Utah and different. Uh, but by the time you're in Chicago, it's Acadian, right? So <laughs> that's the same sort of principle relationship between Hebrew and Aramaic. They're very, very close. Thank you.